welcome to the Open Forum. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all here. Um, we're here to discuss an important topic, which is racial disparities in refugee treatment. Um, and uh, we've had some preliminary discussions to prepare for this event, and I think we're going to uh, have a kind of riveting talk tonight and really interested in what uh, you all uh, want to hear about as well. So first of all, let me introduce briefly uh, our panel guests. To the left of me, I have Diana Dieb. Uh, she's a global shaper um, and is based in Kiev, uh, for the Kiev House. We have Alejandro René Daly Rivero. He's um, w another global shaper uh, out of Colombia. Christophe Cassois is the president of ADECO. Amy Slaughter, next to him, is the senior advisor for refugee, Refuge Point USA, um, and she's also a Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur. And then seated uh, to, at the end of the podium is Dr. Sakina Yukubi, uh, the executive director of the Afghan Institute of Learning and another Schwab Foundation social innovator. So tonight's topic is a, is a broad one, um, and I'm hoping we can get into a lot of detail. Europe has opened its heart um, and has shown a lot of ge generosity to Ukrainian refugees. But that hasn't always been the case for other waves of immigration, especially that from North Africa and the Middle East. What can we do to ensure that all humans who are escaping conflict are treated with respect um, and dignity? Um, and we want to touch on some of the issues here and, and sort of explain what it is that is driving this and what we can do um, to make the change. Um, so first off, I want to open up with Amy and Christoph. Uh, Amy, just take us through sort of what your experience has been to in the response to Ukrainian refugees from your vantage point. Sure, thank you, and thanks for having us here. Um, it's particularly exciting to be addressing a broader audience outside of the official conference center, so I'm excited about this conversation. I also think it's really timely. I have to mention that today marks the second anniversary of the murder of George Floyd in the United States, which set off the largest protest movement in history. Um, and we're just about two weeks um, away from a, a terrible hate crime that happened in upstate New York too, where 10 people were shot, um, motivated by something that the shooter called replacement theory, which is the theory that there's a deliberate plot to replace white populations with black and brown populations. So this is a very timely conversation and we do see racial inequities everywhere. Um, but to come to the, um, the question about the Ukrainian response, we're all obviously very pleased to see the generosity of the response, the, um, the outpouring of support from the general public, the, the nimbleness and speed with which the governments have moved to create new policies and new tools to welcome these refugees. It's really wonderful to see. And I think it sets a new high watermark really in refugee response and I think what we can hope and have to work towards is holding governments accountable for, um, for reaching that watermark again and again with all other refugees in need. Um, and I think we should remember that out of crisis can come opportunity and innovation. So this is a real moment of opportunity to rethink and reshape global refugee response. Christoph, you, you had a role in the innovation in the response to this uh, crisis. Uh, could you take us a little bit through what you did? As a group, we used to uh, support refugees since approximately 15 years uh, from different crises in different geographies in the world. But I need to say that we were obliged to innovate this time for, for two, three reasons. The first one, uh, starting the, the war, uh, we had 1,500 of our associates working, uh, coming from Ukraine and, and uh, working in Eastern Europe, and we had to relocate uh, their family. And it was a huge number of people to relocate in a very few time. And uh, the logistic was absolutely not the same. And trying to find a solution to do that in an efficient way, we were concerned by the fact that, as usual, but I would say in a, like a brutal way, we have to find some solution in terms of housing. We have to find solution in terms of administrative uh, uh, constraints, sometimes in some countries, not the same country by country, etc., etc. And early stage, some few days after the, the start of the war, we said how we can contribute to those families relocation, but also to the other one. And our mission is to find a job to people and to connect companies with candidates. And we say, let's innovate for the very first time 
and uh, creating an infrastructure, what we have called the platform for job, uh, job for Ukraine, Adeco job for Ukraine, giving the opportunity, just as an enabler, it's not a business for sure, to connect all the, application, the applicants and the companies trying to have an impact and a contribution. Because the reality very often around us, many companies would like to do something, but they don't know how to do that, especially the small companies, which are not the organization to deliver that. So in the innovation has been this one, and after some few weeks now, we have uh, shared more than 50,000 resumes, more than 1,200 uh, companies joined uh, this platform, and uh, I would say uh, it's encouraging because each week it's more and more. And we, are, we have added a lot of services now, like training, like uh, some things which are quite uh, an important thing because the gap of skills was also one of the challenge. So that's where we are now. Um, Deanna, you have one of the most unique perspectives on this. Uh, Deanna is half Ukrainian, half Syrian. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you've um, been through um, when the crisis began. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm in a very confusing position where on one hand, I'm absolutely thrilled and thankful to the people of the world for accepting Ukrainian refugees and being so warm and welcoming. And at the same time, I can't help but wonder <laughs> where was this before when the war started in Syria 12 years ago and it has been going on still and Syrian refugees are still uh, coming to Europe and to the world and not receiving the same treatment. Um, I have to say disclaimer that I do not work in refugee topics, so I will not, I'm not in any way an expert on the topic, but I can share my personal story. When the war broke down in Syria, I was uh, 15 and I do not speak Arabic, uh, so I was not really following too closely what was going on here and not in any way compared to now what's happening in Ukraine as I was living through it myself. Um, but so any information I was getting about my Syrian family there was uh, through my father who moved to Ukraine, Syrian and moved to Ukraine uh, like 35 years ago back when it was Soviet Union. Um, and uh, the situation that we saw is they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave Syria and no matter how much we tried to convince them, uh, we offered to make official invitations to come, buy them tickets, find apartments and they said we don't want to we don't want to leave home unless it's completely unbearable, at least at, 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 unless the bomb falls next to our house, we don't want to go. Uh, and so they've been there for, for those 12 years, uh, and since then the country has gone through a terrible economic crisis. Uh, the village where they live is um, a safe, relatively safe space. Uh, there is no active war happening there. Uh, but the country is in deep economic crisis. So many of Syrian refugees right now are not only refugees from war, but also economic refugees. Um, just as an example, Syrian lira, the local currency, dropped immensely. Uh, One dollar used to be 45 lira, now it's 4,000 lira. So it's just complete uh, crush. Um, and then on February 24th, the war broke down in Ukraine. Uh, I will not say started because the war has been going on in Ukraine for eight years. In eastern Ukraine and Crimea has been annexed by Russia uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, so the war escalated in Ukraine on February 24th. Uh, I saw that coming, many of us did, with Russian military being on the borders for quite a long time. They've done this before, but they were never there for so long. And so we, we could tell that something is gonna go wrong. So I started encouraging my family to leave Ukraine two weeks before. And they weren't listening to me. They couldn't believe that something would happen. Diana, nothing is gonna happen, relax, it's okay. Um, my brother luckily listened to me and he left Ukraine three days before. He left Ukraine to go to Russia because he's married to a Russian. And in order for them to go to Europe, they had to go to Russia to get her a visa to Europe. So he left Ukraine three days before war to Russia and he was there when the war broke down and had to stay for another two weeks waiting for her passport. And then they had to leave Russia uh, through Estonia and my brother was interrogated on the Russian border and then he was interrogated on the Estonian border about what was he interrogated about on the Russian border. <laughs> Um, so now my brother and his wife are uh, applied for refugee status in Italy. Uh, my mom and my sisters and my gra grandpa left Ukraine on the second or third day of war 
It took them more than 48 hours by car from Kiev to Lviv, which is on the border with, close to the border with Poland, and then crossing the borders, sleeping two nights in the car because that's, they were just stuck on the road because of long lines. Um, they got to Poland, they spent two months there, and now they went to Germany because there's no more place to stay in Poland. Poland is just filled <laughs> with Ukrainians and there's no, you cannot find apartments. So now they're in Germany and they're also looking for, for housing and applying for a status there. Uh, me, during this time, I was in Lebanon where I moved uh, seven months ago. I moved because uh, I felt that Ukraine is doing well. Before I was involved with reforms, with the startup ecosystem, and I felt, oh, Ukraine is doing well. I've done my job here. I feel like I want to explore my Arab identity. I moved to Lebanon. And a couple months later, war breaks down in Ukraine. So, but I have a lot of uh, Syrian friends who are in Europe now, Syrian friends who are in Lebanon now, and many of them are refugees. And the stories they're telling me are scary. Um, at the same time, my Ukrainian friends and family, the stories they're telling me are absolutely amazing. And I can't help but think that we have to do something about this, but not only as governments, organizations treating refugees, but also as just humans and citizens accepting other people in our countries. You have uh, been through an enormous amount um, in Afghanistan. Uh, we, uh, it is only uh, six months ago, uh, not, not even that we were seeing refugees um, trying to flee that country. Can you sort of talk us through what, what that experience has been like for you? Thank you. First of all, I am very grateful to be here. I think um, it is a, a good opportunity to be all here discuss the issue of the refugee, especially that we are. And me as a person who have been a refugee myself and have been in a refugee camp, and I know how the refugee feels and what, from which country they come, doesn't make difference. And when they come, they are forced out of their country. And if it is war, if it is poverty, if it is hunger, if it is violence, whichever way that they are coming, they are coming because they are forced to. They are not coming because of their um, wishing to go to another country. So no country is going to replace their country. I have been working with refugee for seven years. And refugee, when they come first in the refugee camp, and they come that there is maybe for a short term there, but they stay forever. They are there for long term. And they, they have dignity, they have value, they have uh, resilience, they are educated, but they are sitting there like a, 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 a robot. They are not able to do anything. Their skill is not worth it, anything like that. And so I feel that um, working with refugee and trying to bring refugee also is a universal law that all human beings are equal and everyone has equal right to um, be free, go anywhere they want to. But I feel that there is some difference. I am so glad that um, European opened their arm for the Ukraine people, and it is wonderful. I just want to give you an example. For example, last year, um, uh, people were um, coming to Poland for they are um, uh, about 50 to 100 people were uh, requested to come to Poland. And Poland says that, oh, um, we are not open because we could not let people in because our insurgency in our country, our violence in our country. But what happened when Ukraine uh, people came, they, thousands and thousands of people came to Ukraine and every, to Poland and they uh, have an open arm for them and they accept. My point is that uh, this being discriminated geographically or because somebody is from Middle East or somebody is from Africa or somebody from Southeast Asia, we must have an issue that um, all refugees have equal right, and the law should be the same thing. For example, if the refugee camp and we are giving, providing asylum to a refugee, why don't we just, if we give, give to everybody, but we have refugees sitting for years and years in the refugee camp, still they do not have asylum, and they are suffering, they are barely survived there, and uh, they don't know where to go, they don't know if they are going to go tomorrow or the next day. And as a result, um, you know that today we are in crisis everywhere in the world. There is a war going everywhere. And today in this world economic, um, uh, from we have a leader from all over the world. And uh, we have um, uh, cooperation. We have a 
all kinds of um, um, uh, world leader and also um, um, people who are really concerned about the crisis in the world. I really think this is the place that we should really work in the issue of equality and justice to see the refugee get treatment, the same thing as every refugee around the world, not only one specific area. I am personally not working with Ukraine uh, refugee, but it's not that I don't, I am very happy that they are being helped because I have seen how much the refugee are suffering around the world. And for example, right now we have a lot of Afghan refugees who are sitting in Pakistan, who are sitting in Iran, who are sitting in Turkey, and they are suffering. Their life is miserable. They, are, they, are, they have a skill, they are doctor, they are engineer, but there is nothing for them. I think as a um, um, leader, as a people who are uh, powerful, and we should have a, a, a system that really these people have a skill, we provide for job. We are talking about economic um, growth. And these people, especially women, thousands and thousands of millions of dollars have been spent for educa educating women and trying to empower them and try to give them a skill. All these women are part of economic growth. And these women are sitting around the world without job, without uh, any opportunity, although they are engineers, doctors, nurses. They have all very professional skill, but they are sitting. They are member of the parliament. They are member of the cabinet. They are sitting there doing nothing. And uh, just because they are uh, in their forehead, there is a point that they are from Middle East, or they are from Afghanistan, or they are from South East Asia. So my point is that um, discrimination should be get rid of it, and we should look all the refugee equal. And I think as a, a group that we are here, powerful group, we should do something about to really uh, bring a solution to that issue. That is, I am trying to say. Thank you. Alejandro, you've experienced a similar situation in uh, Central America um, and South America. Um, you know, are you facing um, similar issues to what Sakina is saying? Where, what, where, where are you coming from with, in this debate? Thanks for, for the question, um, and thank you to all my fellow panelists. Um, when you are a forcibly displaced migrant, every time someone else tells their story, you kind of remember yours, and you live all the, all the experience again, which is um, painful, but um, necessary, I guess. Uh, so thank you, Diana, because, because of you, I, I relive my experience. <laughs> but it, no, no, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's part of, of what I have learned in this couple of years, but I, I will go with that afterwards. Um, my name is Alejandro, I'm a four civil displaced migrant from Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is currently the second largest migration crisis in the world. Uh, we are more than 6 million Venezuelan migrants and refugees uh, of a country of 30 million. So one-fifth of the country is out of Venezuela. Um, two millions of Venezuelans, including me, are in Colombia. And um, something we were talking yesterday is that actually most of refugees are hosted by other low- and middle-income countries. Um, so Colombia, Ecuador, Peru hold the most amount of Venezuelan migrants and refugees even though many of them have come to Europe and to the US. The same happens with um, Myanmar, Bangladesh, or India, Pakistan, um, or even Syria, Afghan, Turkey, um, Afghanistan. Um, so there is a, a, a disparity. Um, I, I believe um, something we need to talk about is narrative. Um, what is the narrative we tell ourselves about migrants and refugees? Uh, and I think something that the world has done very well is to create this narrative of supporting Ukrainian people, which I also consider is a turning point in, in refugee treatment. And we're seeing so much support towards Ukrainian refugees, which is amazing. I mean, we, we all want that. Um, we all wonder what was, where was that before, um, or where is that right now? Um, for example, the UN is trying to collect all the money necessary to attain the six million Venezuelan migrants and refugees to the world. Um, they have um, collected about 15% to 20% of the money necessary to attain Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Um, but those goals are um, more um, easily attained with other refugee movement, ref ref refugee situations. So uh, it is a theme of, it depends on when you're born and, and where you're born. 
um, we as Venezuelans, we, we, we don't come from a world, um, but we come from the highest inflation rate in the world. Um, we come from the place where one dollar is probably the salary of six months of someone. Um, so we come from that extreme levels of poverty, um, and that's also a crisis. And that, that also makes you a refugee. Um, I was welcome in Venezuela. I had the opportunity to build a house with my family uh, and to be received. Um, nowadays, I work, I have an organization that is dedicated to integrate Venezuelan migrants and refugees in, other, in Colombia and in other countries, um, and also to fight xenophobia throughout the region, which I think we will talk a bit more about that on the future. But I wanted to end with something that I realized uh, with Davos um, in the last six months. Um, when you're a forcibly displaced migrant uh, refugee, um, you try to make your identity be everything else but that. So your Alejandro, your um, I, I, I study government, and I'm, I'm a global shape or whatever. And everything but the forcibly displaced migrant because yeah, that's an image. I mean, that, that, that's a brand that you get. You're the migrant or you're the refugee. And you don't want to be that. You want to be so much more. You want to be another Colombian that has the same opportunity as Colombians. And you want to be treated as one of them. And then you realize that you don't have the same accent, that you don't like the same food, that when it's a holiday, you don't have nowhere to go because your family is not with you. Uh, and so many things that are common daily basis of people that are not refugees. And you realize that that's not your story. Your story is that you were never with your mom in mom's day or with your father because you're displaced. Um, and then I realized that's the story we got, uh, but that's what makes us unique. Um, and that's our role as well, to be able to share our stories. Um, so now I embrace being a forcibly displaced migrant as part of my story. I mean, I didn't want it. Uh, it's what I got. Um, but now I know why I have it. And, and what's the role I have. And I think we all share that. Um, as you can see, we have some amazing people on this panel with some extraordinary stories. But all of you touched on um, the issue at hand, which is uh, racism, okay? So how are we seeing, why, why are people in Europe more uh, accepting of Ukrainians? Who's fanning the flames of racism? I kind of want to turn to you, Amy, because I know You've talked about this in terms of the US perspective. Um, how, why, why is it that certain groups are being welcomed more than others? Thank you. I'm definitely not an expert on European politics, but I definitely see some trends here and in the US and all over the world, really, and that is anti-immigrant language being co-opted by populist agendas. Um, and beyond that, I'm not sure that I can speculate. I can certainly list some examples of where I see the inequities, for instance, the fact that the EU spends a lot of money to, um, for the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept migrants trying to reach Europe, and um, that's called externalizing the borders, so pushing border control further and further away from the actual borders of Europe so that people can't reach the borders to make an asylum claim. We also see it with the recent agreement that the UK um, entered into with Rwanda to return asylum seekers, not even return, they didn't come from Rwanda, but to send asylum seekers to Rwanda uh, that arrive into the UK just as a deterrent for future asylum seekers. Um, Australia has an offshoring policy where asylum seekers that arrive on their shore get sent to the local islands into detention. And of course in the US where I'm from, we do everything we can to limit um, border crossings across the southern border, including most recently, Title 42, which um, limits uh, asylum seekers coming across ostensibly due to COVID and public health concerns, but really uh, it's clear that that's not the goal. Um, so there's just a, there's a lot of evidence of, of this in the world, and I think we just have to name it what it is. You know, these are racist and anti-Islamic um, policies that uh, emerge from a history of, of global white supremacy. Um, many of these policies, of course, um, started to be put in place before the pandemic hit. Um, and one of the things that, Sakina, you touched on this, the number of educated Afghan women who are um, uh, in refugee camps and, and, ha and can't work. I mean, 
given the labour shortages that we're seeing in, in, in Western Europe, we're seeing them across the world, Australia, again, with its harsh migration policies. In some states in the United States, they have a 1% unemployment rate. Um, you know, Christoph, can, can, that, can people's perceptions of immigration change and can refugees be treated better because of, the move, because of that movement? I think partly, not only. Partly because I think, uh, according to the companies, the fact that today we have a lot of scarcity, and you have explained that properly, uh, refugees mainly are educated. They have their own skills. They have developed in their home country. Sometimes certification is not the same, but the skills are here. Uh, it's one of the motivation for companies to say it, it could be a way also to solve uh, the scarcity problem. But I want to come back to, to your point because I, I think it's what I've learned personally. It's my experience with this. I remember we were putting at work 500 uh, refugees per year, trying to build an infrastructure and to understand how to deal with that. And what you learn when you really deep dive on that, it's to listen to the story of the people. And, and probably, and that's why Ukraine is something which is now on top. Some countries, we didn't know the, the, the story of the people. And I remember lots of recruiters in our company, they wanted to have an impact. And they say, I would like to go to help those guys and not to do a traditional recruitment because I feel more useful to do that. I've learned that when you are young, it's so difficult because when you listen to the story of the people, you have difficulty to keep distance with that. It's very difficult. It's really something very heavy. And it was for people with a lot of resilience like the, the refugees have also. So that was the first lesson learned. The second was also based on the fact that in many countries, you have a bureaucracy everywhere. I remember in France, the, the, the country where I come from, before having your first uh, training in terms of language, you needed to have all the internal process managed, administrative process, it was six months. So during six months, you can't do anything. You can't have any statue, and you can be educated in terms of language, which is one of the barriers when you join a new country. So what I mean, partly, yes, it could be a question to say, we could find people motivated to rebuild their life. It's exactly your point, to keep their identity, but to build a new life. But the reality, first, there is a story behind, and to understand the story makes you more, I would say, Welcome. And I think Ukraine, everybody knows because the story is everywhere on the screens. And I remember I was in front of one guy coming from uh, Congo, another person coming from Syria. They have explained to me something I didn't know. I'm supposed to be educated and to know this story, but I didn't know. But when I was listening to that, coming back at home, I was telling the story to my wife, to my children, because it was something I've been impacted and it was emotionally speaking. So for a part, yes, it's, yeah, you have a rational, but I think also you have a story and we need to explain because people mix everything. Refugees, it's not a choice. You have no choice. And when you have understood that, as a company, as a citizen, as an association, you can't put additional rules uh, and constraints. It's a question of just uh, civilization. On that note, are we relying too much on governments to um, tell those stories um, and instead they're, they're going another way? Um, and how do we overcome um, you know, the, the perception that is uh, put out there of refugees? Alejandro, you, you, you spoke earlier about xenophobia. I mean, what, what can we do um, to overcome that? Um, I, I believe it is fundamental to create new symbols to tell stories. And, and, and I believe that's what, what, was, what is happening with Ukrainian refugees. Um, we are seeing the stories every day on, the me on, on social media. And we are connecting emotionally with these stories because um, probably even you know or have a friend that lives in Ukraine. Um, even I, living in Venezuela, had some friends in Ukraine. And, and you could see in their own social media what is happening and that make you connect. Um, but as well, that's, that's one part of the story. I think we as either host communities, in your case, or, or migrants and refugees, um, we need to create these new symbols. So I'm gonna give you some examples of what we have done in, in Colombia that has helped us fight xenophobia. Um, for example, 
we have a project in Global Shapers called Shapers for Venezuela, where we encourage advocacy campaigns to fight xenophobia through different cities and hubs in Latin America. In my case, in, in Bogota, we organize a campaign where we, um, there is a major bridge that connects Colombia and Venezuela in Cucuta, the city border. And this bridge, we cover all the bridge with photographies alongside a famous photographer called JR. Uh, he has famous giant uh, photographies. He, he, he took a giant photo of a Ukrainian refugee. Um, so we partnered with him and we took 500 pictures of Venezuelan migrants and refugees and we posed and we planted on the bridge. Um, when people were crossing by, they didn't know if, if people were Colombian or Venezuelans because we look exactly the same. <laughs> so th that was a symbol. That, that was a way of, tell of telling people in another way, we do look exactly the same. And it is really hard to find if someone is Colombian or Venezuelan just by their looks. Um, um, maybe you can find the difference between a Colombian or Venezuelan or even a Ukrainian or a Polish, but sometimes it's not that easy. And that's what makes us realize in another way that we are really the same. And that change of mind happened through stories and happens, we always say, or well, I always say, it happens through the body. What, what happened to you when you listen to that story, it, it stays. And that change that it goes re regularly person by person, that's what we need to change the narrative. Um, just to, quit, to, uh, to end on that note, um, I personally took almost all the pictures of all the Venezuelan migrants, of th those 500 pictures. Um, and I remember one, um, his name is Jose. Uh, he walked one week from Caracas to Bogota with his two children, one was seven years old and one was two years old. Um, they literally walk seven days without stopping to arrive to, to Caracas, to Bogota. And, and I stood with them and I took a picture and I told him, how, how, how's everything been? I mean, how, how are you well? How are you being welcomed? And he told me, not that good. Um, I, I came here, and we were in a refugee camp, um, and they have yelled me everything in, from this part to this part, and I tried to work here and they didn't allow me, so I, I really don't know what to do. And you come to these stories after seven days of walking and you're like, <sighs> and that's xenophobia. That, that's where, where everything connects, because that didn't happen to me. Um, but that is happening now. And, and that's what we can foresee could happen with Ukrainians. It's not happening now. Well, what will happen in eight years if we don't have the, this mindset prepared for that moment? Uh, it could happen there. You're Ukrainian, go there. That's what is happening now in Venezuela. So we cannot uh, foresee the future. And my advice to Europe is be prepared to promote integration because it's not gonna be easy. But in a couple of years, if we are not prepared, xenophobia can be really damaging for our societies. Sakina, um, you know, one of the issues that Afghan refugees are facing is, you know, they don't look the same as the countries that they're um, moving to. And, and in fact, um, you know, uh, reliant on governments um, coming up with policies where they are going to allow um, entry. Um, something that has been brought up a number of times is the bureaucracy, um, the difficulty of getting, um, you know, permits, uh, uh, visas, applications. Um, where, where, is this, where is the situation at right now for Afghani refugees? Thank you. Well, first of all, I think that, uh, as I said before, um, there, is a, there is a way uh, that people look different for Afghan refugee compared to other refugee. It's right, they have a topic in their forehead that they are Afghan, they are coming from a country that most of the people are terror, most of the people are um, fighter, whatever, uh, anyway. The issue is that, that they don't accept them as who they are. And second thing, as working in the refugee camp, as uh, Christopher says that, if we listen to the story of the refugee and listen to see uh, where they are stand, for example, they are educated. And when they talk, they, you appreciate and listen to them and identify their skill. And once you identify their skill, and, and instead of sending somebody else in the refugee camp to help them, pick up from the refugee 
a doctor, a nurse, a, a somebody to help in the refugee camp. What happened, our tendency is that to say, we are helping the refugees, especially in the area like in Middle East or in uh, Southeast Asia or in Africa. We think that they don't know anything. We don't give them recognition. We don't really value them. And we send people to help them and we give them secondhand things. And we don't really realize what is their culture, what is their value. They are also human beings, they are also equal. So if we listen, as Christopher said, and we recognize and identify their skill, and then in the refugee camp, provide for them a skill. For example, if a doctor go and work with people in the refugee camp, or is a nurse, or an engineer, or um, electrician, or whoever, and you know, you find out, you be surprised that a lot of them are very good entrepreneurs. They have excellent skill and they are able to do good work, but they are sitting years and years. I saw in my own eyes, you know, my heart bleed. When I saw people sitting there and not doing anything and losing their skill and being without job, being poor in poverty, getting sick, and uh, losing that skill because just they are the refugee, they cannot do anything. The country does not allow them. The refugee camp does not allow them to do something. Yes, they provide for them something. Okay, here, learn some English classes, or here, uh, some literacy. Without really going to the refugee camp, doing a survey, finding out the skill of these people, and giving them opportunity to work. And that's happening to Afghan people. Afghan people, who they are refugee in everywhere, especially right now in Iran, they do not give them a job at all. They do not accept them. As a matter of fact, they, if, if, if it's opportunity for them to get them and put them in jail, that's the way they do. And for Turkey, they are not really give them opportunity to use their skill. Do you know how many? Also, I want to share with you that this is something that is, again, break my heart. The top of the cream of the country is living. The brain of the country is living because they could not tolerate, because they think, they do critical thinking, they got education. They could not stay in the country they live, and they are in the refugee camp being deteriorated. So if we are really trying to reach out to those, uh, those refugees, we need to reach those people and, and promote their skill and help them to help themselves and help others. And that is my advice for the Europe, for any other country. Please do not be uh, prejudiced. One of the reasons that um, you ask the question why people are, um, for example, open for Ukraine and not for other, because they are white, because they are Christian, because the other people are colored people, they are brown, they are black, they are yellow, and, and people are becoming prejudiced day by day more and more. And we need to really break this thing. And we need, as a, as a advanced um, um, leader in the world, as a people who are really working, working for economic growth, as a people looking at yeah, these many challenges, uh, uh, like with um, opportunity for job and environmental job, we need to really uh, be equal. We need to see uh, our differences is just break that, and once we do that, then we can reach out and we can solve the, the, uh, the issue of the refugee. Afghan refugee has tough time around the world, and also inside Afghanistan, we have refugee from one province to the next one, because they were forced from uh, their province to another province. They are sitting in my, inside my own country right now. They are starving, they are selling their children, there is uh, early child marriages increasing, the women are dying of hunger and sickness because the country is in poverty and also the money has been frozen. And for Afghanistan, when the money is frozen, who is suffering? The people of Afghanistan are suffering, not the government, the people of Afghanistan. So as a result, we have many, many displaced people inside the country from one province to the next province. And nobody is reaching for them. No one is helping them. And also there is no assistance for them. Do and we need to we need to wait, Sakina, for governments to act, though, or are there, or is there a role for the private sector, for civic groups um, in, in this? Um, you know, Amy, like, who, uh, 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 you've been involved with civic societies too, Deanna, like, 
do we have to wait for a government to make the action or if we hear the stories, are there not steps that can be taken before well, then? Well, see, that is one of the reasons. For example, my organisation right now underground working in the area of uh, health and education and empowering women continuously. As a matter of fact, we expand programme. We have tough time sending money to Afghanistan because the money has been frozen and also all the bank are closed. We could not send the money. We send the money through Hawala system. But a lot of people said, how do you send the money and we cannot send money? and they were not supporting. My point is that most of the money has been frozen and the, all this leader has to help that unfreeze that money. And here is the voice that I can raise my voice and say, not because I am just saying for these people or that people, I'm not a politician. My point, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm really working as a non-profit organization. My point as the concern is a civil society. Those people are dying. Children, five million children right now in Afghanistan are malnourished. 25 million people are starving to death right now in Afghanistan. 260 hospitals and clinics have been closed because everybody ran away and all the international organizations leave out of Afghanistan. So Afghanistan in a crisis, in a disaster situation. So those money being froze is not just hurting the government, it's hurting the people of Afghanistan. So I am calling for many, many countries to please and for us that money that it goes to Afghanistan and help the people of Afghanistan. And that's, that's the main issue. Thank you. Um, I, I do think that some non-profits um, and uh, NGOs, governments, uh, non-government organisations are playing sort of a bigger role on the ground there um, while governments figure out their policies. But in the Ukrainian situation, we've also seen the private sector jump in. And, and I think, you know, it, it does worth kind of figuring out how can, you know, private sector play more of a role here? Well, uh, you know... No, uh, Sakina, I'm going to take, take this over uh, okay. to Amy first, yes, um, and then uh, we can jump over to Deanna yeah. after. Thank you. I think it's an exciting time because in many ways the public is really out ahead of, its, of their governments and can put pressure on the governments um, to change the policies and make it easier for refugees to come to take the jobs that are being offered to them. Employers are offering jobs, but there aren't the mechanisms and the visas to accelerate that process. So, yeah, the, you really get bogged down in the bureaucracy. But it's great to see this, this surge of interest from the, private, the, the public and the private sector. Um, to bring more refugees, to fill, um, you know, um, occupations that are difficult to fill in Western countries. We just see that that is way out ahead of where governments are policy-wise, and so we're kind of dragging them along with us. Um, Christoph, I mean, you had the experience, you came in from the private sector. What were the, what was the biggest things that you learned when you, when you did that? I think, as Sakina, you said it uh, before, I think the, the problem is coming from the fact that even when you are not a refugee, if you don't manage your job during more than six, 12 months, many companies consider that your qualification skills are obsolete. And that's a drama, but that's a fact. And what I, I see when you have long-term unemployment in the market, people have strong difficulty to come back in the market and you need to have like a social coaching. What I mean, the difference with Ukraine this time, and that's probably a lesson learned we could use, is to say, European Commission has said, okay, you have a statue, a special one, the S1, which means you can work the day after. It changed everything, because if you have a good doctor, or if you are good in the construction site, you can, you, you won't lose your, your skills and your self-confidence also, because it's a question of the candidate losing the self-confidence, being in the, management of this bureaucracy and the company who knows that you were doing the same job before. After the, the last 50%, I'm less candid. Sometimes you need to have some people who used to work with refugees because the reality, it's not so easy for a company to integrate people when you have the culture, the language and everything. And what we need to absolutely avoid is to have a bad experience. You don't take time, you want to have productivity in a company, and at the end of the day, you don't have understood that you need to coach people to start. And here, that's why having some, I would say, uh, uh, ONG, uh, NGO or uh, association taking care of that is really important also as a partnership, because companies sometimes don't have the skills inside to manage that. So I think the first one, the speed, is probably a lesson learned from this crisis, is to say, let's do that, whatever the war, whatever the geography, 
just to avoid to lose such a lot of skills. Second one, I think we need to encourage to have this infrastructure. We talked about a platform. It was the first time we did that. We didn't imagine the impact. It's more than 1,000 people finding a job. And I, I was the first surprised to see so many companies plugging their job opportunities here. It was not so obvious before. Yana, um, you've had the experience with this in terms of um, technology, reaching out, and also the experience of being able to talk to someone about what their experience is. Are, P, are refugees in a frame of mind when they arrive uh, from Ukraine that they are able to work? Like, is it, where are they at when they're coming in and, and what's your experience been of this? I have to understand that while jobs are super important for refugees when they come, this will not be the first thing they need. The first thing they will need is housing and uh, community and feeling safe and uh, mental health support because people are traumatized. What I hear from my friends and family who left Ukraine the first weeks and still three months later, they shake from the sound of a train passing by because they think it's missiles falling. It's just terrifying. It's, um, it's not easy going uh, to interviews and learning a new language and working for a new company when you're in that state. And at the same time, we need to think, oh, do these people have enough savings to not work for half a year and take care of their mental health? In Ukraine, most of the people do not. In Syria, most of the people do not. In many countries, people do not. And that's why they do need support from the civil society and from the governments in order to just feel safer at first when they arrive, but also they really need support from the community and from regular people. And that's what we see now happening with Ukrainians, and it's absolutely heartwarming. Um, together with our team, we built a platform uh, helping uh, Ukraine, and we're connecting the dots between international help and helping Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, different volunteers reached out to us who help Ukrainians in uh, different countries in Europe. And they're accepting Ukrainian families in their houses, and they're saying, we don't really know what to do with them. We see they're traumatized and we don't know how to talk to them about it, how we can help. Um, so we need some kind of guidance uh, to know how we can support people. We understood that, okay, we probably can help them uh, get medical insurance, show them around the city, but there's so much more that needs to be done. Um, and then the question is, whose responsibility is it? <laughs> Uh, again, I'm not an expert in refugees, but that's what I'm seeing in the field that right now it's in the hands of people who are welp welcoming refugees in their houses or those who are welcoming refugees in, uh, in refugee housing. Um, yeah. Um, when uh, when w refugees arrive um, in various countries in uh, South America or Central America, Alejandro, do you feel that their experience is similar or are you seeing differences that, um, that we can learn from? Um, uh, 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 does it work better in different states? Um, in order to promote integration of migrants and refugees, um, I believe it is fundamental to do four things um, and you have both mentioned it, uh, you have all mentioned it, but to put it like in a step by step uh, we need to first solve the administrative issues, meaning that they are regular, though they have the refugee status, or they have, um, in my case in Venezuela, uh, a special um, permission to be in the country because we are not considered refugees because we are not fleeing from a war. Well, that's a whole conversation. <laughs> we are considered forcibly displaced migrants. Then, it is fundamental to have an economic integration that people can work, that people can have their resources. Again, it's different sometimes for refugees because the refugee status doesn't allow you to work while you're pending on that status. That's really complicated. Um, then you have social and cultural integration, um, ma making sure that we as a community, in this case, uh, Switzerland, can understand the culture and the values of Ukrainians, for example, and that we can exchange that culture. And then we have civic integration, participation of, of migrants. I mean, we are also people, so we can also participate in decisions because at the end we live in those communities, so we're gonna be, get affected by the, uh, by the public policies. In the case of Venezuelan migrants and refugees, um, the go government of Colombia, uh, 
recently in the last year announced a massive regularization of two million Venezuelans. So we were allowed, we are going to be allowed to work, to uh, receive healthcare, to go to the same schools as Colombians. It is one of the major milestones in refugee treatment in the world. Um, a massive allocation of two, migra of two million people, of almost two million people. Uh, and that's kind of the bold moves that as well we are seeing in Europe. So we are, I mean, there are some bad points, but there are some good points. Um, when we think of the situation of Afghan people and Syrian people, we also see other variables. Um, and I do believe the thing of race, ethnicity, and religion being clear determinants here. Uh, we share the same language, culture, and religion from Colombia to Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador. But it's not the same when uh, extracontinental migrants and refugees, I mean, that's completely different. Um, and I think what we need to question ourselves is why it is so hard to talk with someone that looks different to me? Um, and I think that's the, the major question here. Um, jump in, Diana. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in with one comment. Um, so, so people here, okay, Ukrainians are white with blue eyes, they look just like us, people feel connected. And then uh, people fear of Arabs because of the m how they're portrayed in media, they're terrorists, they're scary, different culture, Islam. Um, but it's, the truth is it's not that. Um, I, I moved to Lebanon seven months ago and my Ukrainian friends were asking me, what are you crazy, what are you doing? Why are you going to Lebanon? Will you have to wear burqa all the time? And I'm like, guys, Lebanon is actually super open-minded. There's people with tattoos, there's clubs, uh, you can do anything. Uh, come visit me. Uh, in the p first four months when I was there, I was posting on Instagram all the time how beautiful Lebanon is. I was sh uh, shooting short interviews with interesting Lebanese people that I would meet so that I could just spread awareness and show my friends that what Lebanon is like. And they were all fascinated. And since they saw uh, what I was sharing, around 20 people made plans to come from Ukraine, made plans to come visit me in Lebanon. Then war broke down, so they couldn't come, but two already did before that. Um, and then I'm thinking, uh, okay, so I come from Ukrainian Syrian family. Uh, I look pretty white, right? Uh, I have three siblings. Uh, two, my sister and my brother look kind of the same as me. Lighter hair, blue eyes, uh, lighter skin. My little sister is more like my dad. She has uh, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes, and darker skin. She looks way more Syrian than we do. We come from the same family, we come from the same blood, but we would be treated differently, her and I, in Europe. And it's just mind-blowing to me, because to me, I think, we're, at the end of the day, we're all the same people. <laughs> Why does it matter? And, um, oh, sorry, just getting emotional. Um, I do want to um, make sure that uh, we open it up to questions um, from the audience. Um, so just, ooh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's an excited one. Wait, I can't see because of the lights. So, oh, hey, that, you get to go first. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, we're two people here for questions. I. Oh, I am please. Johanna Suleta, and I am a cross-pollinator building the bridge or improving the relationships between diplomacy, the corporate world, and arts and culture. I am, I am Colombian-British, and when I moved to the UK, work uh, plenty with refugees initiatives, and that's when I also understood. Um, this is early 2000s because at that point, Colombia as well was in the lists of worst countries on earth. We were probably banned in 90% of the world. And I very much feel um, the message that you're giving. For me, what it changed that was um, engaging with the arts. And the arts is really a healer and unifier between cultures. And in fact, I've been coming to the World Economic Forum context for several years. And it, this is the first time that I have with me the Global Arts Director of the British Council, 
precisely because we would like to bring more of the arts and the humanities into the conversation. And not only here, that's precisely the kind of programs that he takes over in 200 countries. Um, so I think we can all uh, aspire to that very I mean, how much can culture and arts make a difference? We've been talking about stories. I mean, if we know each other's stories um, and we work together, it, it's just the exchange of, um, Amy, are you seeing, you know, partnerships with arts groups in the work that you're doing? Not a lot. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad that the speaker brought it up because I don't think we do see enough of that, no. And I think it is very compelling. Obviously, it's a way to, to build bridges. Um, one thing that uh, I think is very useful is that with the Ukrainians coming to Europe, it really is great exposure um, to what refugees need all over the world. The things that we've talked about that they need here, jobs and housing and mental health care, and this is what refugees need all over the world. And we, I think Alejandro said it, but I'd emphasize it again, that 85% of refugees stay in their home regions. They flee across the border and stay in the neighboring countries. And so they're hosted by developing countries that are struggling economically and politically as well. So we always hear about the ones that reach the West, but that's not where most of them are. So I think it's great that people are learning more about refugees' needs. We are also happy to work more with the World Economic Forum helping facilitate that. I Thank you, and I leave Kinder to say his piece. Sorry to hijack your no. conversation. This is a public forum. It's one no, of no. the best things about the West. <laughs> no, that's amazing. I mean, and, and thank you, speakers. It's been really amazing listening to you all. I mean, our, our work at British Council is very much about building cultural relations. And we have the three pillars of education, the language, and arts and culture. And I obviously head up the arts and culture and it's a very powerful space. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all elect um, in the West in particular our political leaders and we rely on them to make great decisions. Um, sometimes the decisions aren't so good. And so in a way, um, our activities in a sense bypass those structures by working with people to people relationships across the world and I think if we had more kind of art and cultural activity on the ground in our communities, we'd have far more empathy and understanding about other cultures. And therefore that interaction between different people from across the world regularly amplified and invested in um, from a policy point of view is really important. I've just come back from Wales. They've got a really interesting act called New, New Generations Within that, they talk about art, health, mental health, and the role that, you know, the infrastructure, education, and schools play in terms of enabling communities to really understand one another and deal with the trauma of history in a genuine way. And that trauma we're living, you know, whether it's in Ukraine, Afghanistan, or Syria, um, and we must look at it in a, in, the, in a lens which is fair and not bias, but of course, politics is politics. So there's something else also at play that sometimes we don't understand. So creating these collaborative communities that have conscious uh, approaches to collaboration and com compassion is, is something that's really special and we hold dear. So we'd be really, really keen to actively um, participate in this type of forum and not be sitting in the echo chamber of the comforts within the art sphere. Thanks very much. Okay. May I add something yeah, to that? Yeah, please do. Um, I believe it's, it would be cool to give some concrete examples of how can we do exactly that. Um, so I'm going to tell you two things that we did that I think actually all of you can do here. Um, but I see some young people, so I, I will encourage young people to do this um, in your high school, university, um, or your work, wh whatever you want. Um, we did something, well, we created something with the Moer Art Museum of Bogota called the Traveler's Book. Uh, it is a book, literally printed, uh, and we facilitated uh, some workshops within the museums where migrants and refugees came to write their own stories. And then this book that has the written stories traveled to different cities in Colombia. And it 
continue to get filled and filled and get filled with stories of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Uh, now this book is currently being exhibited in, in museums there. Um, and that's a concrete example of, of using arts and using community building um, engagement to literally tell stories because what is the, what a better way to listen to other people's stories than literally reading from their own hands. And when you read it, you, you see in the reading the pain, about the stories, the mistakes, uh, the, and the, the whole story is there. Um, and I think that could be easily done in this space. Uh, we could have one hour of come write your story in a book that you can stick with paper. And, and then go from school from school in doubles um, and let's see what ends with that. I mean, wh what would be the result of a book that tells the stories of the people that live in Davos? And many of those stories will be probably German, probably will be over that are Afghan or, or even Colombian British. Um, and when you, as a community, go there and read that book, it will be a good example of who are actually people that are living here um, and what are the stories behind them. Jump in with a couple comments. Uh, one was, I think, Amy, you said that uh, with the Ukrainian refugees in Europe, now we're getting to see really what the needs of refugees are, but actually the majority of them are all over the world and not in Europe. I mean, refugees and migrants of different kinds. And uh, what I'm seeing in Lebanon now, Lebanon is a tiny country, uh, four, five million people, most of Lebanese are outside of Lebanon. Um, and so the quarter of the Lebanese population now are Syrian refugees living in refugee camps. And they need help, but they are now stuck in a country that is in crisis itself, in deep economic and political crisis. So I think like what's happening now in, uh, in Europe with Ukraine is, is really bringing up, we see uh, what support is needed, and we can learn from this, and then take it to other countries as well where also UN is represented, UNICEF is represented, Red Cross is represented, and so on. Learning on Ukraine and bringing it elsewhere, uh, the framework, and bringing it up to these standards, I think is the way to go. But I want to take you back to arts and culture. Uh, I want to give you an amazing example of how, uh, of, of a, an activity. So it was 2016, I spent a month in Berlin, and it was during Ramadan. And uh, during Ramadan, uh, people break fast after iftar in the evening with the sunset. So a really nice initiative was organized in one of the parks in Berlin. They organized, that was before COVID, a big dinner for everyone <laughs> with sharing food. So uh, it was kind of a dialogue uh, for the local community of Germans living in, in Berlin and uh, the local refugees from Syria. And so everyone could bring their own food, put it on a long table, eat together, play music, talk. Uh, Syrian refugees were learning German, they could practice German with the local people. And just meeting each other and talking in person and smiling, just seeing the person helps so much. Because I, 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 I see that we fear from afar, uh, but once you meet the person you see it's just the same person as you, I think it's really helpful. So bringing in these human interactions, also through arts and music and food, uh, can be very helpful. <laughs> Worth noting um, at the WEF this year, um, you know, st storytelling um, from Ukraine has been a large part. It's been very prominent at the WEF. Um, concerts, uh, uh, speeches, uh, dinners hosted on the sidelines. Um, but also, you know, to Sakina's point, we haven't seen that with Afghanistan or Syria. Um, and maybe there's a role um, for organisations to be playing in making sure that various stories are represented. Because I, I do think that the way uh, that the Ukrainians have been able to tell their story and tell it loudly um, in the media is making a big difference uh, to refugees. Um, I, I see some nodding heads. Uh, do, you, do you want to jump in there? Or do we have any questions, more questions from the audience? Sorry, <laughs> we will hear you, people in the audience will not. A minha zavud Ryan, yes, Brazil. Yajil v Kiev, Lipki. So I said, I'm Ryan Santos from Brazil. I used to live in Kiev. Uh, had a lot of friends, mostly girlfriends, as a black man in Kiev. Uh, my question is uh, a lot of them, a lot of my friends and acquaintances, they left Kiev, they left Ukraine. 
And at the time I lived in Ukraine in 2019, both Odessa and Kyiv, the dreams for those women were t was to live in Europe. Find a, a French man, a beautiful Italian man, and live in Europe. And now these women are in France, are in Italy, and one of my friends, she's already dating a French guy and they're about to get married. My question is, do you think they're, they're I mean, let's say the war ends in one month, do you think they'll ever come back? Now they, they have the, the most dream of visa. And uh, the, the second question is, uh, I read some conspiracy theory that this um, will raise the fertility rate of Europe. Getting kids and women over to this side of the border. So uh, but, but, but folk, my, my focus on the first, do you think these people will ever come back? So I'm not sure I can solve your dating life, but I do <laughs> think that um, we have actually... We have actually heard um, that um, most refugees, you know, don't want to leave. Um, that is not the experience that we think. Uh, Deanna, you wanted to jump in or Sakina, yep. Uh, first of all, it depends on the individual. The individual who love their country, who love their land, and who really um, have their heart there, no matter what kind of life, they will get into a different a second country. They will go finally back to their country if they have opportunity to go if they will not be killed, if they will not be captured. But the person who stay there, and there are many people, as you said, that they come as a refugee and they stay in that country and they never go. And they are those people who, beginning, they have their heart to go in that country and become American or European and sit in that country. And I have, the, I, I really have the experience. I work with thousands and thousands of young men and young women in Afghanistan, in area of uh, education, health, and as you talk about the culture, about art. And I know a lot of them want to come back, but there are also many of them who already settled in America or settled in Canada, and they do not want to come. And I, many times, I am a speaker in different symposium, and I encourage them to go back to their country because the country invests on them, and the country needs them to go back there, and they should go back to their country. But then the same times, if they come as the, the first when they come and they got a, a political asylum and they got a visa and they got mm, a stable place, and they will not go. And I encourage the refugee to go because I, I went back to my country. I went back to my country, I was in the United States, I had higher education, I had good job, but I went back to Afghanistan in 31 years, I worked in the refugee camp and then during the Taliban underground and now openly I am working in Afghanistan for 31 years because I believe in my country. So there are, there are many other of my trainer who came back into America and Canada and they never go back. And we need those people to go back, they don't go back. The uh, experience of the exile can be very different in, in various places. I mean, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, you wanted to jump in, Diana. Uh, what were you going to say? Yeah. Uh, first thing, awesome. Good for you for being to Kiev. Kiev is the best city on earth. I encourage everyone to come visit when we win the war. Um, very vibrant, very fun, amazing. And everybody speaks English, <laughs> almost. <laughs> depending on where you are. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I wanted to say, uh, there are statistics on uh, the number of refugees that leave uh, the country and then come back, and it very much is tied to how long they spend uh, outside of their country. So let's say the, the, the worst hurts, and then after one month, amazingly, with a magic wand, it's over, 99% of people will go back. Only the people who wanted to immigrate for time will use this opportunity and stay, but it's definitely not most. But the longer, the, like I'm talking in terms of Ukraine, the longer the war is, the more tied people will be in their new place of uh, living. They, right now for Ukraine, it's mostly women and children. They're putting their children in school. They're putting their teenage children into universities. Uh, they're finding jobs. When you find a job, you have to sign a contract. It's at least one year. Um, in the first month, we were thinking, okay, hopefully this will be over in just a couple of weeks and we'll all go back. But now it's third month and we understand this will probably at least go till the end of the year. So people find jobs, they sign uh, work agreements, um, contracts. Um, so <coughs> it depends very much on how long it is. But already we're seeing 
uh, cases of people who left to Europe and they're already going back to Ukraine while there's active war. My best friend who spent in Berlin two months, she said, I cannot be here anymore. Even though she loves Berlin and she's been there many times, she said, I can't be here anymore, I just wanna go home. And she goes home back to Ukraine. <laughs> Um, and that's the case for many people. Another friend of mine, also I'm speaking about Berlin because that's where most of my friends went. Uh, he's been dreaming of moving to Berlin for the past three years. He's been trying to get a job in the specific field that he wants. And now he's finally there, he has a residency and he says, Diana, I, I didn't want to get here like this. This is not the way I wanted to do it. I do not feel happy about this and I want to go back. But he's a man in the age between 18 and 60. Uh, for men like that, uh, you may be drafted into the army. There are specific, uh, specific mobilization laws, different ways of mobilization. It's a completely different topic. But if he goes back to Ukraine now, he will not be able to leave. He will be stuck there. Um, and he was abroad when everything happened. Uh, so now he's in Berlin, but he says, not like that. And it's stories of many people. And it's also stories of people internally displaced in Ukraine. So my father, who lived in Kiev, now he is closer to Western Ukraine. And he says, I don't feel at home here. I just want to go back to our apartment in Kiev. But our apartment in Kiev is not so far from an airport. And that airport has been targeted several times already. It's not safe to be here, to be there. But you already see people, other friends of mine spent three months in Western Ukraine and they said, okay, now I want to go home. People are getting used to war. <laughs> They're getting used to, to the thought that a missile can fa fall somewhere in the city and they're going back. Uh, so, yes, I think some people will use this as an opportunity to go to Europe and stay. Others will uh, stay there just because life happens that way. Maybe you find someone, maybe you get a, an amazing job opportunity and you want to do it. Um, different reasons. Uh, but there are many, many Ukrainians who want to go back and we're talking about this already with fellow Ukrainians that we want to go back and rebuild the country and rebuild it better than it was before. Um, and this will be an amazing opportunity to build innovative cities, green cities, smart cities. And then we will see a huge wave of tourism from Europe and from everywhere else in the world to Ukraine. I was already seeing this before war. Uh, friends of mine moving to Kiev from New York, from Copenhagen, from London, saying, I love Kiev, I cannot be anywhere else. I see this will be happening even more, not only to Kiev, but everywhere else in Ukraine. So, yes and no. <laughs> Do we have another question, I think, um, just here? Just another fellow uh, Global Shaper from Six Cells, and just thank you so much for sharing all your stories. Um, it's been an incredible experience. Um, I just wanted to touch on two points, I think. Just going back to that point of how do we make this the high water the mark? How do we keep that for future crises um, and, and refugee crises in that case? Um, I think President Zelensky in his um, speech made really two amazing initiatives and for this to come from a country in war is incredible because one was this 24-hour response and then this um, food exporter group in that sense. So it's amazing that these solutions can come from a country in war. That's the first one. So how do we keep that uh, mark and what happens when your country maybe disappears in a couple of decades that might be the case in some countries? Um, who wants to, Christoph, do you want to take the, the first question? I, I can start, yes. We have talked before about the fact that it was a question of culture, language, and potentially also education. Uh, just to, to have the lesson learned from this crisis, I would say, first, um, there's a question of education, to explain what it is, refugees. Because here we have an example, I, I would say, many people have heard about that. For the very first time, it was more probably uh, uh, on top of all the agenda. And uh, it's a good way probably for people to understand better what it is really and not to mix everything because I see people are mixing a lot of things, migration, uh, refugees. So many concepts are one at the end and at the end of the day, it's absolutely not the same. So that's the first. The second one, uh, personally working in a company, uh, if you don't kill this bureaucracy, it's really, really difficult for everyone because Self-confidence is part of the game. If you want to create collaboration, communities, and so on, you need to arrive and to feel that you are somebody and you are not nobody. And for that, you need to absolutely to integrate as soon as possible when you arrive. For sure, you need housing to start, and after you need to find a community, and after a job could come, but you don't need to have six, 12 months. And again, my experience is it's too long, and 
to make a decision like it has, ma it has been made for Ukraine, I think it's uh, the first time we see that. Uh, it's something to put in the law now, to say it should be like that for any crisis, provided it, it is recognized as a crisis. So I would say that's the second one. Potentially the third one, I, I'm more optimistic about uh, also young generation because they are uh, traveling more. So they know more what is different. What I see, and especially in my, in my industry where we are recruiting people, discrimination was something which was really in the middle of, uh, uh, I would say, the problem and the challenge of this industry 20, 30 years ago. Now when I see people, they are more aware about what, what are the difference in terms of culture, sometimes they travel, sometimes they would like also to dedicate the time for a nice purpose in a, a caritative association, for example. So it's not all, but I, I would say it's more than before. So here it's more a question of optimism than something to do on top of. So I would say some first things I, I could say from my side. I think building off of what Christoph said, um, one of the silver linings of this crisis is that new systems are being built to receive and integrate refugees and new, new policies, even new um, you know, visa categories, uh, and none of that existed in 2015 when there was a large uh, arrival of Syrians and Afghans, and so I think it sort of took the continent by shot, you know, surprise. Um, but the great thing is systems are now being built. I think people's hearts are now touched and hopefully primed for empathy for all of the other refugees in need that will come. Other comments? I just want to give an example of how Europe is learning on previous uh, crisis, uh, refugee crises. Uh, I don't like calling it a crisis, but okay, if that's our language. Um, so for example, in the UK, they recently launched a governmental program of uh, matching uh, people living in UK and uh, Ukrainian families coming in. Um, for, for those uh, people living in UK who want to host uh, Ukrainians. And it's on a government level, uh, they're talking about it everywhere. Um, this was not the case before. Before it was done by, by NGOs. And what I want to showcase is that I think governments are learning and can learn from civil society, from grassroots movements. Uh, but it's important to poke them uh, and to, to share the knowledge and to share the frameworks. And I think it's important to Christoph's point for businesses to poke the government to say, hey, if we, if, if we want to employ people, we need to do it fast. So come on, implement uh, necessary policies for us to do that. I think we have time for one more question, if it's out there. Uh, oh, sorry, wait. I'm sorry. No. I, uh, Jeremy actually asked one more very important question that we should not forget. Oh, yes. Jump in. And uh, the question was, what happens when your country disappears? And uh, this just gives me chills because it's scary. There are several nations in the world that live without land. Uh, because their land was taken away from them. I know Jeremy comes from Seychelles, and uh, now due to uh, climate change, there is a chance that Seychelles will, not, will disappear. And what happens to the nation? Uh, I do not have answers. I just, maybe someone else does, but I just wanted to point that out, that it is scary. I'm looking at Palestine as well, living in Lebanon, seeing what's going on there. Uh, it, it's scary. <laughs> I want to go to that question, very uh, simple uh, question I want to answer in a simple way. First of all, when you work with the refugee, several things that you have to really keep in mind. That first of all, you have to build a relationship with the refugee, that they trust you. You have to build the trust between you, whichever organization you are, build the trust with the refugee, that they trust you. Because they come from a place that they are traumatized, they are disturbed, they, they had been violated, so they have this wall between them. So you have to break that wall in a way to show that you really care for them. That's to build the trust. Second thing is that I really think that you have to really listen to them. What is their need? As Chris says, yes, they need housing. Yes, they need the, this, all other things. But what they need, you have to ask from them. If they need a school, if they need a hospital, if they need a clinic, if they need shelter, if they need food, you have to ask them. You cannot just go and say, okay, I'm going to do this for you, or I'm going to do that. It doesn't work. Believe me, it does not work. And you know, millions of dollars have been spent in the refugee camp just by going in the water. It did not have the outcome. So it means that you have to have built a trust. You have to also use that community. 
you have to use that community to work with you, that refugee community, and that way they feel belonging. They feel that they are belong to this. And so they start welcoming you and share with you their thinking, and then you can be able to be successful. That's I wanted to just to say to you that that's, thank you. And any refugee camp, and any nation, uh, I think it works with everybody. I don't have an answer to your question, which I think is an answer, a question that we all should ask ourselves, um, because the, the stories of the small island development states, um, I, I knew Jeremy in, from um, the pre-COP, because we're both climate activists, and we have other lives besides being migrants and refugees. We, we do climate advocacy. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, just quick to Jeremy, and then something to all of us, that your story was the thing that struck me the most about the importance of the climate crisis. Um, because when you hear the stories of people living in a small development islands and you realize what could happen if climate crisis disappears your state, it leaves you in a complete whole other different level of understanding the gravity of what we're living as humanity. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge and thank you for that. But I wanted to make you all a question, um, kind of to be closing. That's something that we do in, in, in our conversation methodology that we created that is called, translated to English, it would be a conversation with the dudes. I think so, but in Spanish is un guayoyo con los panas. Un guayoyo is a, a specific way of saying coffee in Venezuela, and panas is a specific way of saying friends in Venezuela. So it's a very Venezuelan theme. Um, what we do is we gather people to have coffee and talk about um, what we call the migration duel. Um, or in, in English, I think it would be the migration grief. Uh, because you are grieving. You're constantly grieving when you're a refugee or a migrant. So I wanted to ask you all, because we all have traveled or been, I guess, I, I'm trying to guess that you have all lived in different countries. I hope so. Um, two questions. Uh, now that you're a migrant or a refugee, or when you live in another country, what was the thing that you miss the most, or what are the things, or what is the thing that you miss the most currently? Uh, what could you say to someone from Switzerland, from Davos, if they have to flee their country? And I, if you want to start. Oh, well, we'll start with me. <laughs> um, I'm Australian, uh, and I live in the United States. Um, and I miss my football team the most. Uh, and I, I think if anyone would, uh, would know that Australia is um, one of the most beautiful places in the world. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I, I have lived abroad in several other countries and I always miss my friends and family the most. And what would you say to someone? What, what would you say to someone that has to flee their country? No, be strong, be flexible, be open. I'll I, I continue. Um, the, the things I miss the most um, is my grandma, because she stayed in, in Venezuela and she never left. Um, and she died there and I couldn't see her. And that's the reality of <coughs> most migrants and refugees. Um, what I would say to someone is, um, try to put yourself in the shoes of other persons um, because you never know when it could happen to you. I'm French uh, and I'm living now in, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, what I miss the most is my family. <laughs> and uh, if I had to come back from here with some key message, I would say listen more and speak with your heart. You, sir. Yes. Um, for me, I miss my country. I want to go to my country, and my country has been war, and we do not know what's going to happen still. Still, we are not sure what's going to happen to Afghanistan. I think that as a refugee, I am in, in the United States, I want to go back to my country no matter what. And also, um, that's that I miss the most, my country. And the second thing for the people, I feel that you should, especially for youth, when I'm working with them, and I see them disappointed, when I see them cry, young men and young women, they don't know what to do. I say, be hopeful. Do not give up. 
just be hopeful and have patience. That's what I'm saying. I'm sorry for crying, but it's very fresh. <laughs> Um, even though I left Kiev uh, willfully seven months ago before war, now I feel like when I feel homesick for Kiev, I cannot go back. Uh, when I was visiting Europe to see my friends and family who are now refugees, I felt homesick. I could go to Beirut where I already have friends, but it's because I got lucky. I don't know, lucky is the, if lucky is the word, that I moved four months before war started, so I already had a community in Lebanon to go to when I'm feeling homesick. My friends and family and other Ukrainians who are now in Europe, when they feel homesick, they have nowhere to go. Or they do go back to active war, as I already said. So what do I miss about Kyiv is really good coffee in those hipster coffee shops, like third wave coffee shops with filter and V60 and so on. They don't have that in Lebanon. I'm considering opening a coffee shop there myself. <laughs> And uh, I miss uh, very stylish Ukrainians who try to like dress very cool and just express their, uh, their personality through that. It's very cute and I miss that. And what I will uh, say to people here in Switzerland, uh, Alejandro, I misunderstood your question when you said that. So how I understood is uh, that if you had to flee your country, what I would advise you. So I'm gonna answer it how I understood it. <laughs> What I would advise you, if you have to flee last minute, you have an hour to pack and go, make sure you take with you something very personal and intimate that will remind you of home. Maybe a poster, maybe a statue of something, something emotional, because that will make you feel like home wherever you are. Um, that's my answer. And I wanna uh, finish, if I may, on one story that I heard from uh, fellow Ukrainian volunteers who are now in Europe who are helping Ukraine back home. Um, so they, they were buying medicine um, and they were in one of the volunteer um, hubs and two Syrian girls, teenagers came to the hub and they said that they wanted to help and they gave 12 euro, the money that they had saved up. They said, you Ukrainians needed more now. The Syrian teenagers are refugees in Europe helping Ukrainians. And uh, the, my fellow volunteer, she, she tried not to take the money at all, but they were insisting. She cried, of course. She took the money, she used it to pay for sending medicine back to Ukraine. So that's back to my point that we're all people, we're all same people after all. So I don't know, let's be human to each other. Thank you so much, Diana, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your stories today. Um, I think they've been heartbreaking, but also give us a lot of hope um, I hope that everyone's taken something away from this about what we can do to change it. That high water mark that we're all um, proud of with Ukraine, let's keep that going. Um, and please, uh, thank you very much for joining us today.